Is my chair lower than yours? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I think it is. Fun. Well, you you chose the chairs. God damn it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Maybe we should start with that. <laughs> uh, hi. <laughs> yes. This is Voices in the Dark. I'm Dre. I'm John. And I'm slightly upset because I think I picked a chair that makes me look shorter than I am. Uh, yeah, but you, but you picked it. Yes, I uh, did. So you can come and watch Dre be little and me gradually slump in my chair because I really fucked up my back in the gym the other day, so I'm going to be in agony. But you can also come and see as we try and uh, start fitting out our studio space. We've got a fun mandala behind us right now. We've got, well, Dre's got a billion and one plans for the studio situation. Yeah, lots of ideas I wanted to make. Well, I wanted to be the kind of room that would be super cool to use as a workspace, even if we weren't filming in it, mm. but also to look amazing so we can film it. So it needs a vibrating bed as <laughs> a first, first item. Um, but for now, we're just we're making it up as we go along. Your feedback will be appreciated, but potentially disregarded. Feel free, <laughs> <laughs> feel free to get in touch. Um, this is, so as you know, the next episode of The Modern Stoic, and mm. we're going to be talking about letter number 29, which has a very boring title, the, uh, the one from the published collection, on the critical condition of Marcellinus, Marcellinus, I'm not sure. I guess if we were doing Lucilius, then it's Marcellinus. It'll be Marcellinus. Marcellinus. I, I would guess. I'll try and not mention him as much as possible. Um, but what the, the letter is really interesting, actually. I, uh, I kind of perked up when I was reading this one. And it's about how and when to give advice and when not to. Um, what people do to avoid seeing what's right in front of them. So if you're the person receiving advice and you're just not wanting to hear it. Uh, how to get, uh, how to avoid getting overwhelmed in life, and also takes us back to the importance of having your own code, which is a big thing for us. Very important. And I never break my code. Ever. Well, no. pr probably I don't. <laughs> when it comes to like being a dick to myself, I think I break it all the time. But okay. otherwise, um, yeah, we haven't recorded for a little while, so it's fun to get back into yes. things. And. Uh, so I've, I've forgotten all the things that we need to say. The first thing that I want to say is for those watching or come, come over and watch and look at the cool T-shirt I'm wearing. Which yes. Is, um, which is actually beautifully smooth and soft. Um, and it says alien. But you also get one that says human. I'm wearing a cap, actually, that says human on. And these are really cool, fun, um, artistic shirts that have been designed by my wonderful boyfriend, Jamie Johnston. And he is uh, the person who also makes all the beautiful art on our website for the particular episodes. If it looks cool and original, he made it. <laughs> <laughs> if, it if it doesn't, it's because uh, he was busy and we got some other shit yeah. that we put on the site. So you can go and uh, if, if you hurry, you can be one of the first bunch of customers for these and get, I think, 20% off. Um, go to jamiecjohnstone.com. Yeah, when I get like one of each, I think at least. Yeah, we weren't like, going to go around like as the gayest couple imaginable with oh, like, we'd be matching. alien and yeah. human. Well, him and me, you and oh. me. <laughs> well, you, you can decide. Part of the, the, the concept is the fun sort of notion like you could wear the human one, but to every other species in existence, you're the alien. So what's the difference? Hmm. What, what are you going to wear? Um, so go check those out, jamiecjohnstone.com. Uh, I'll put that in the show notes too, in case you can't spell his name. Um, cool. Now, do we have a question this time or not? No, we're going to we're going to okay. do some questions, some Q and A from listeners, um, and please write in with your questions. Yes. We're going to do. Um, we will answer one question at the beginning of each episode, instead of taking forever to tell you where to like us on Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff. We'll keep that really short and instead we'll be like an agony aunt, I think. Yeah, agony uncles. Well, I'm going to be an agony from my back. <laughs> you can take the uncle role okay. um, in this. So you want to do that as, as part of the episode? Rather yeah, than, I think uh, so. Okay. I think it'll be kind of cool to start with like such and such from Weybridge writes to us to Weybridge. say, <laughs> that's where I was today. <laughs> Did someone ask you a question there? <laughs> Why, why do I always get raped at work? <laughs> and they're like, well, you shouldn't look so sexy. <laughs> you know, I mean, obviously, slightly more tactful and interesting, but uh, that's the, the spiel, the, the thing. 
Okay. They send, you know, we, we, they send us interesting psychological questions, problems they have in their lives they need solving, and we use our superior mind powers to fix them. Okay. <laughs> I think I'll need more of the coffee that we're currently drinking to, to get to my superior mind power. Mm. Um, but we could, you know, we could also let's work it out as we go along. Maybe we have like little mini sods, uh, like the the Q and A, as more mm. questions come cool. in. So to do that, you can message us on facebookcom v and the d. You can tweet us at v and the d. You can message us on Instagram at v and the d dot pot. Um, I'll probably be the one seeing the Instagram ones now that I've noticed that <laughs> there were all these message requests stacked uh, up yes. that didn't show up as being uh, in in the inbox, but. You know, some were just people trying to sell me weed. Neat. I mean, it's sort of neat. Do you, th do you think I need someone through Instagram to sell me weed? I don't know. Let's get, let's get it together. See, like, I was always warned that I'd be offered drugs, mm. you know, all the time, everywhere as a kid. You know, they make it seem like it's really, really easy. It, it's it when I when I when I, when I intentionally decided okay I'm gonna try some weed. Hmm. It was surprisingly hard to get all this stuff. <laughs> I think that's I was just like, the universe I've been lied to. Yeah. Why aren't they offering? Well, I, I know, I've rarely noticed if I'm being offered drugs. People go, you know, that guy you just passed on the street. He just he offered. You. I was like, what? I thought he just mumbled. Okay. I don't notice. Um, I also want to shout out to one of our new Patreon supporters who's been uh, all up engaged in our faces on Facebook, which we really appreciate. Um, Michael, I, your surname looks Danish, but it might not be. But if it's Danish, I think it's pronounced something like Jaxen. But is pronounced uh, is is written like Jorgensen, but I think it could be Jorgensen. Okay. So you can tell me if I got that right or not. Thanks for being in touch. We gave you a bunch of stoic related things. He claimed the uh, free uh, Tim Ferriss audio book version of the letters that we're discussing, which uh, mm -hmm. we had a code for a while, but uh, yes. I've cancelled my Audible subscription now, so <laughs> <What>? <laughs> so you can't have it. You anymore. made me get one. Yeah, well, you can use the <laughs> you can use the thing then. Okay. If people you want to hit us up and try and get that free ebook, maybe the the free audio book, then do so, and we'll see if we can still sort that out. And mm -hmm. uh, we send him some extra ebooks as well on stoicism. So come chat, pays off. Um, so thank you to all our Patreon supporters. If you enjoy the show, if you feel that we're bringing something cool into your life, uh, it would help us a lot and make us smile if you could uh, sign up on patreon.com slash D, where you can make a recurring donation from as little as a dollar up to anything you possibly want. Um, and that would really help because we love doing this. Yes. And we hope you do too. <laughs> Being done by us. So... Um, I've no idea how long we've been talking. The coffee is hopefully going to kick in soon. Let's hopefully talk about not too hard. Yep, yeah, <laughs> not not too hard. The bathroom is close, but not that close. Uh, yeah, let's get cracking. So this letter begins. Uh, Lachilius has apparently been asking about their mutual friend, Marcellinus. Marcellinus. Well, if it's classical pronunciation, it's K. Mar Marcellinus. Marcellinus. Okay. Um, and Seneca says he's not seen this dude for a while and he thinks basically that he's avoiding Seneca. Seneca says he seldom comes to see me for no other reason than he is afraid to hear the truth. He can't handle the truth. And at present he is removed from, any, from my danger of hearing it for one must not talk to a man unless he is willing to listen. And he says like essentially why would you, would you go and chide the deaf for not listening to you? essentially saying, you know, he's not going to hear you. He's choosing not to hear you in this case. So why would you go and force yourself on him? And Seneca imagines Lucilius putting up a bit of a fight to this. He says, but your answer, why should, I sp why should I spare words? They cost nothing. I cannot know whether I shall help the man to whom I give advice, but I know well that I shall help someone if I advise many. I must scatter this advice by the handful. It is important. It is impossible that one who tries often should not sometimes succeed. That's what Lucilius is saying. That's what Lucilius is saying. Lucilius is wrong. Well, Seneca agrees. <laughs> <laughs> so well done. You are also Seneca. Uh. We are all Seneca. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what, so why do you think he's wrong? Oh, because uh, the assumption that you know, if he advises lots of people, at least some of them will get benefit. No. Virtually none, because if you're scattershotting it, 
to people that you think need advice uh you think they need advice they don't mm -hmm. it's only people that want to change and want advice and the number of people that ask you for advice that actually want it is smaller than you think mm. so the percentage is so small that what you're doing is wasting energy and time and also you're appearing to be like a busybody like you're degrading your relationships you're saying more than necessary violating the 48 laws of power um it is just a general bad practice people don't want advice very rarely do they actually want advice um and so stop giving it have you fallen prey to this uh a little bit but also i've seen it as a trend in my family it's just the the thing like my my parents needed to tell me when i they thought i was wrong mm. like up front even when and sometimes they were right but i didn't want to hear it it wasn't the right time to tell me it wasn't you know like sometimes things you have to learn for yourself or you have to get to a point where you go I i'm not sure about this before you're receptive to someone else giving you something there's also the need um to let so if advice has been given, you also need to allow time for it to kind of germinate. Um, so first of all, I totally agree that people have to really be in a position where they want help and they ask for help before they can be helped. Um, but I was listening to your appearance on Adulting with Ebony, mm -hmm. this other podcast earlier today. Great job. Both uh, of you. Thank you. It was, it was uh, really thank you, cool. Ebony. That was a lovely one. Yeah, I enjoyed good. it. I'll put a link in the show notes to go check that out. Uh, adulting is a great word. Um, and this this came up. She was uh, recalling or talking about some when she understood kind of her, her own nature better, it, it helped her to know and be able to tell people around her that if she gets advice or is told something that she, her, or, or invited to do something in the moment, the initial reaction might be no, rejection, push back. And then after a little time, you might mull it over a few days later and be like, you know what, you were right. Because I think a lot of us, we need that time. Yeah. We need that time to get over the fact that something that we, something has been criticized that we do. Um, and often if it's something that, you know, deep down we know we need to change a behavior or something, it causes that friction. It, 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 is, it hurts us. It's the thing that we don't want to look at because we know it's a problem. And so it's kind of like, fuck you, don't make me look at the monster in the closet. I, I don't yeah. want to. So recognizing that is helpful. And not just going, not turning to, not turning around and going, you made me feel bad. But, <laughs> you know, also maybe just take some time and reflect and see, was it useful? Because may maybe it will be useful. Yeah, feedback. This is where you want to operate like the general of an army with your own mind listen to the sage counsel of the other sides of your own personality but also the outside influences like other people but ultimately you make the choices mm. so see them as underlings saying sir i think we should go around the mountain you know and you go hmm thank you but no <laughs> over the mountain it is through the mountain or Yes, let's go around the mountain. You're right, mm -hmm. you know, Captain such and such. Like operating that way disengages the offloading of responsibility that many people seem to kind of they, the brain brain mode switches for many people when someone else is telling them what they should do. It's like they're surrendering their will to the other person if they accept the advice. It's a subconscious thing that shouldn't happen, but many people feel that way and make themselves feel that way mm. whereas if you think of them as a advisor and you're still the king you know you're making the decision and when an advisor gives you good advice you follow it when an advisor gives you bad advice you go mm, no thank you yeah it's it can be it can certainly be tricky because you can you can feel like there's so many different voices in your head telling you different things but there it's good not to think you could, you could end up fearing that you're schizophrenic, which I definitely have, like I have conflicting, like I could do this because of this and I've got an argument for this, an argument for that. Mm -hmm. Whereas it's much more liberating and empowering to do what you're saying, which is to go, okay, well, these are all possibilities that are being given to me in like the council chamber in my head. And now I have to be the CEO or the king and make the call. But the call is made having received a bunch of different and maybe contradictory information. Yeah. And you have to believe 
in making the right call in the sense of and this is where the Dan Pena mantra I might be wrong but I'm never in doubt comes mm -hmm. into play you have to believe in your choice and go for it and don't doubt it now it could still be the wrong the wrong choice but it doesn't matter what you do then is pivot if you can pivot so it's better to you know accidentally run into a wall than it is to just never sort of start running and what we've spoken about in in the past a few times is that regret is trying to just express a wish for the past which you is impossible yeah so this is like i, I think this is where we can actually get into what sometimes sounds a bit too saccharine for me but the whole you 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 can be hashtag grateful in a way for when stuff did go wrong not because it's wonderful it went wrong but because you're like okay well i won't do that again at least i know that was a bad choice for me i can go forwards knowing that i've learned something from that situation doesn't mean i enjoyed it the whole point yeah. is you didn't enjoy it which is what taught you something when it comes to advice i maybe i use the words i'd like some advice to people but i think most often i don't i don't ask people for advice expecting them to give me a solution it's more that by having the conversation and being willing to hear what they say i can explore the different aspects of the thing and find out how i actually feel hmm. deeper down that it's so maybe everyone I speak to thinks that I never take their advice, but, mm -hmm. but it's very helpful to me to have those conversations. So mm -hmm. I don't know if, you, if you've noticed that, that maybe I, I listen to you a lot, da, 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 and then I do something totally different. <laughs> it, it's not because I didn't care what you said. It's, it actually was very helpful in the process of discovering what I wanted to do. The opposite, always the opposite. Oh, always the, every single time. Um, I also think that please can you help me is a pretty magical phrase certainly to me that if someone that especially if it's someone i already care about and they ask me that i'm basically all in at that point of course i'm going to help you and i i, w I was really touched uh, it was quite a while ago somebody sent me an email i'd sort of been doing a bit of soul searching and i'd asked a few people close to me like so what would you say you think i'm i'm good at and what am i not so good at and just sort of i think it was an exercise this author dory clark put together perhaps okay. um she does was written about like self-reinvention and it's like you have like a committee meeting or something and you get people around but in this case it was by letter and you're like no seriously i want to hear what mm -hmm. do you think and this person wrote, like, you go so out of your way for your friends. Like, if they ask you for help, you'll do practically anything for them. And I thought, I, th I think that's true. And that's awesome. Like, I'm really proud of that. But it's also not something that I ever set out to do. It's not like, I will do it. It's just that that's what feels absolutely right. And like, to my core, yeah. what's important to me. And so I think being able to ask for help you can often feel like you're in a sort of weak position and yet we talked about this in our interview with Jason Gaynor at the creator of Mastermind Talks. By asking, you're also giving the, the other person the opportunity to have this wonderful experience of helping you because helping people is also very fucking rewarding. And it can be selfish in a way to be yeah. like, no, I'm not, not accepting your help, I'm not accepting your help. I'm just going to burn out in a blaze of uh, no self-obsession. Self yeah. Especially if then your failure impacts other people or the pos possible work or collaborations that could have happened if you had the bandwidth and the emotional like capability to do mm -hmm. stuff, which you don't because you're, you know, you're collapsing under the weight of having to do something on your own. Mm. Um, but I also wanted to draw out a distinction here that I think there's quite a big difference between somebody saying, help me and somebody saying, save me. And save me, I think, is where it becomes much more likely it's going to be a burden. I think mm. to me, or at least the way I'm interpreting this, save me is basically I've given up on helping myself. I want to put that responsibility on you now. And now you, you're you going to have to look after everything. Okay. Has and, anyone ever said save me? No, but I mean, that's what I feel is sometimes being communicated. Okay. If someone someone's asking for help, but you need to like distinguish in your mind is it help me which i think is like 
hey, I'm struggling. I could use, you know, a bit of input, a bit of assistance with some things. Right. I've got, or, still got what, my own. Or are they asking the other thing? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Or are they saying basically, you've got to look after me. It's like the equivalent of emotionally saying, I am moving in with you. <laughs> and now you've got to look after everything. I'm not going to feed myself or wash myself. Mm. That sounds like a good holiday, though. It does. If you could do that to someone. <laughs> Maybe for your birthday, I'll save you. <laughs> Just for 24 hours. Nice. Okay. But people get stuck in, 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 that, in that trap, especially if they've got a bit of a white knight complex. They want people. Yeah. They're attracted to people who are basically abdicating their responsibility to look after themselves. And of course, you know, this can't, I've been there where you actually have basically just lost it for a period and you really need direct, absolute care. But that's, you know, for a limited period. Yeah. Otherwise, you you know, you need to, you still need to regain the responsibility for yourself. Some people are attracted to that, and some people are also attracted to being saved. Yeah, they're keep, they keep repeating that as a loop. Hmm. 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 Mm. <laughs> <laughs> we need pipes. <laughs> we do. Okay. Um. That's interesting that sort of Seneca singles this out as an issue to talk about and that uh, Lucilius, if real, feels different. I guess he's younger. He still wants to change the world by using his smarts. Well, it's very earnest, isn't it? And, you know, you could see... It, it is based on the false assumption and super arrogant thought. If only they knew what I knew, mm -hmm. they would choose differently. Mm-hmm. Incorrect. So wrong. Um, people, it, it is an assumption that, that, that you know what's best and that you have more information or that, inform, or, that or even that if your information is so blatantly clear in its truth. Mm -hmm. Whereas there is no truth. There's no such thing. Is this outside of Assassin's Creed again? <laughs> yes. Well, I wrote it down as a thing because it's true mm -hmm. that there is no truth. <laughs> um, it is, I mean, nearly everything is uh, subjective in the universe, except maybe the laws of thermodynamics. And even then, you know, only based on what we've observed so far. Okay. Um, you know, the fact that you can't be sure which event happened first between two events happening like light year apart. Right, and and and, there's no, and it doesn't matter because there is no such thing as which one happened first in terms of um, communication between the two distances. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's based on which side you're looking at from. So if they both if they both happen, let's say, which is an oxymoron, at the same time, mm -hmm. what will happen is that one side will see their event happen first, and then the other, and the other side will see the other one, the other way around. Yeah, this sounds like a great premise for a sci-fi novel if it hasn't already been done. Well, this kind of paradox is usually some you know played with a little bit in, in sci-fi, so maybe there is hmm. something like that. But there is no truth, uh, and, and every time we think we know what the universe means, you know, someone comes along and throws it up in the air. Like you know, we we thought we figured it out with Newton, and then Einstein comes along and goes, Newton was you know clever, but no, he didn't get it mm -hmm. <laughs> because he had limited information. I found more information. Here you go. Over the rest of the podcast, I want you to keep interrupting with, but there is no truth. There is no truth. <laughs> there is no, there fucking is no truth. truth. Um, so what about, what about Lucilius' scattershot approach? Um, and Seneca says his, his kind of pushback is you've got to choose your battles, essentially. He says that which takes effect by chance is not an art. Now, wisdom is an art. It should have a definite aim, choosing only those who will make progress, but withdrawing from those whom it has come to regard as hopeless. Yep. Yet, he is another like qualifier, not abandoning them too soon, and just when the case is becoming hopeless, trying drastic remedies. So what he's saying is, you know, you know, you need to know when to give up, but don't give up too soon, and don't just go crazy drastic at the last second like that's going to work either. Yeah. So... If you believe that you've got something worthwhile, whether it's you've accumulated money, you're doing well in your career, or you've accumulated wisdom, and you can help others with their advice, you have to treat it in a sort of a rising tide approach and pull people on your way up. And what you want to do is be specific. Build a pack. Select people that are worth 
helping because they already they're already in started on that journey they want mm -hmm. to become better they've maybe you know stumbled upon something and failed and they go oh maybe i'm not right and they're looking for answers and if you recognize that in someone help them help like pull them up with you with you um i'm thinking of a couple examples um recently that i heard one of them was will smith when peter sage shared with us the story of that kid he met in some african country i forget which one that wanted to mm. um you know come to america and work with him yeah and th this this kid was working as an extra or something on a film that they were that yeah. will smith was in and this like a completely outrageous story unfolded yeah and i mean the the end of the story is that this kid did manage to make it to america managed to re-meet will smith and will smith found him a job and like helped him out you know got him education and so on um but it required a will smith type person mm -hmm. to pull people up because you know he's been in the struggle he knows what it's like he's come through it and he wants to help and he, f he finds people worthwhile he's not giving college um you know um well, not bursary what's it called scholarships scholarships to a million people like indiscriminately but when he finds someone worth helping he helps them and another example like that was apparently denzel washington paid for s oh the guy that played in black panther mm -hmm. the movie apparently his acting school uh was paid for by denzel washington i don't know how that happened or what caused it but he was like this kid's good he should go some places yeah I mean, you can't rely on that, of course. You know, not necessarily going to be the one picked out of the crowd by one of these people, but then you'd have to be ready to receive that. Mm. Intellectual nepotism. Mm. Like, don't help people because just because they're related genetically to you. But if you find kindred souls, do help them. And help them more than you help anyone else. Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, I had one train of thought going one way, but then this, what you were just saying tunes into something i was thinking about today this sort of i don't know if it's a hopeless sort of position to be in or an even self-indulgent position to be in but when it comes to like an opportunity that i would like to 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 take up some sort of like partnership or i don't know creating something with someone or someone going hey i i see who you are i love what you do i want you to come and contribute to my vision that's I went for a walk today and was thinking, that's kind of what I want. I don't want to be auditioning and trying to sell myself. I want to be invited on the basis of someone already seeing that thing in me. And I, I was like questioning myself, is that, just, is that just arrogance? And is that also laziness by not, you know, trying to go and hustle and get those opportunities and whatever? Or is that just a more... Is that it's not like a, it, it's like waiting around to, to win the lottery so i don't i don't know i feel confused over it and yet that would be the most meaningful thing that would also make me most want to grow yeah. and live up to that vote of confidence and trust i think it's important because it's not laziness because it is one of the most accurate human instincts the yes you when it's not there, it's not there. It's not like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I'll put in two years of good work and suddenly they'll go, you know what, this kid's good. <laughs> that doesn't happen. Okay. It doesn't happen. There's an immediate recognition. Now, you have to back it up by doing the hard work afterwards. But usually when people think that you're worth something, they notice it. Anyway, the, the, if there's an equivalence of souls, if, if suddenly you're like in, in the pure darkness, you see someone across the other side and you're like... Mm -hmm, and they're mm -hmm. like, hello. That kind of feeling that you have with people, whether you're romantically involved with them or because you're like, I love what you do. That is a true feeling and one of the ones that should be prized above many, many others. I agree. That's why if, if that's why it means so fucking much if somebody has like they maybe they heard a podcast that we made or they read something that I wrote and they're like, I fucking love that. Would you like to come on my show or would you like to write something that is such a vote of confidence like hey i i admire something that you've done and it makes me want to get more to work with you to you know where it's like looking at your your track record and finding some sort of connection as opposed to the sort of hi i'll do anything you want me to do and hopefully you'll like me 
yeah. and hopefully you'll see something in me which just feels so completely disempowering and so mm. like when yeah. i've done it in the past the harder i worked the less i was valued hmm. it was a direct it was a direct linked relationship between those two things they weren't just loosely correlated the more i gave to prove myself i'm like okay I'll, i haven't proven myself yet i should try harder what can mm -hmm. i do okay you know is this like putting out too much yeah yeah. It's too desperate, too needy, and the other person, if they don't feel yet, doing that is just, it just feels disgusting to them. Like, they just, like, uh, whatever, like, and they, they see it as, oh, I deserve this extra work. Hmm. Um, whereas if they re immediately recognized you for who you are, and they love what you're doing, they love what you do, um, it's a completely different type of dynamic. And you'll be doing those things because you feel empowered by how they treat you. As opposed to be going, I need to think of a way to be 20% better because they still haven't given you my opportunity. Hmm. It's a very, very different mindset. It's a shitty mindset. <laughs> so we come with, like, with all of the, the most articulate analyses on, <laughs> on this podcast. Um, so looking back at the letter a little bit, um, so that, that last bit was about finding the right time um, and choosing your targets for who you're going to help. Um, there's also an element of uh, the fear of sunken costs that you have to know that it is at a certain point, it's to, to everyone's benefit that you give up. If somebody doesn't want to be helped, it's like, again, back to like the, the watery metaphors, <laughs> they will pull you down. If you're trying to save them from drowning and they're just going to keep thrashing around, you're both going to go down. And... I guess it'd be pretty grim if it was literally you just have to let go, but that is also what you have to do. Yep. And it can be terrifying in relationships, like romantic as well as business things. And yet there's also this incredible freedom that you can feel simply if you, you do walk away and just say, yeah, nope. Okay, you might, you're not walking into a place of certainty by any means, but like Phil McKernan talked about, at least you know what you don't want and walk away yep. from it. You need a crazy amount of self-centeredness and being on the right path to give absolute help, absolutely. Like, you must have helped yourself first. And even then, there might be times where your inner power falters for whatever reason, at which point you can't do that. But there is, there is, there, you can, you know, be a leader that way. Mm -hmm. If you've sorted yourself out first, the, the you know, put on your first, your gas, your oxygen mask first. Your orgasm mask your, first. Is that I like didn't it? say orgasm. <laughs> That's what I didn't say. I, I can't remember what I was trying to say, but uh, the, the oxygen mask metaphor. Mm -hmm. And I think there's the people that don't, they put it on other people first. Um, but also I think the most common thing, and this is a funny visual metaphor I was playing with the other day, is most people are like, oh my God, I should put it on first. Oh no, but I want to put it on them. And they just don't put it on anyone. And then everyone dies. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, if you're going to help them to your own detriment, at least do it. If people are not showing that they respect themselves, it's very hard to respect them. Yeah. And I get. I think we live in a society or culture where selfishness has just been branded a very dirty word and it's been used to go to describe things that are well beyond like acting purely in your own self-interest mm. for the de with the detriment of others in mind any moralistic judgment is a method of control society or a specific person is trying to shame you into doing what they want not what is right what they want you to do or something they're insecure about, like uh, a mutual friend of ours who made a comment earlier today. Um, why well, I, I said something about uh, why 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 hadn't they got laid? And they're like, well, we're not all whores like you. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, that's an interesting suggestion. Um, but said everything about like using a moral judgment against me because that person is not feeling cool and secure in their love life sexual life right now so if i can like look at something else that maybe i actually want and say that it's shit i feel better about what i'm doing hmm. i left that as anonymous as fucking possible <laughs> so there's no backlash um so what about their unpronounceably named friend um seneca says 
there is indeed danger that he may pull his helper down, like I was saying. Um, for there is, in, there is in him a native character of great vigor, though it is already inclining to wickedness. Nevertheless, I shall brave this danger and be bold enough to show him his faults. He will act in his usual way. He will have recourse to wit, the wit that can call forth smiles even from mourners. He will turn the jest first against himself and then against me. He will forestall every word which I am about to utter. He will quiz on philosophic systems. He will accuse philosophers of accepting dolls, keeping mistresses, and indulging their appetites. So, to unpack that a little bit, he's basically, Seneca is basically describing the defense mechanisms of people who are not yet ready to be helped or are scared of being helped. First off, they make jokes to create a distance between the seriousness of what's happening and how they they feel about it which is one of the key functions of jokes to try and take away the weight of the emotional resonance that a particular subject has and that can be helpful if it helps you deal with it like it can be really positive if you're looking at something very dark in your life maybe you, you've got a cancer diagnosis or something if you can laugh maybe that's really positive but if you're just laughing at something that you actually know you need to do and you're trying to avoid doing it you're just hiding the same mechanism of like pushing away and making it lighter can work, but it may not be to your benefit, to your health in this case. Um, then uh, people stop you before you've got your point out. They trip you up over every detail so that they'll never see the bigger picture, which drives me fucking nuts. Like it's, it's not about if I'm giving advice, but if I, I'm just like, so there was this thing that happened and they're like, oh, what time of day was it? And like, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter what time of day was it. And they were saying, saying to me like, oh, were you, were you sitting at a table? And this is like, fuck <laughs> off. This is not the point, not the fucking point of the story. And you just get derailed all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes that's intentional. Sometimes it's not. Um, and then they'll go in a defensive way for the, huh? why do you have this particular point of view? Are you drawing on these people? Basically suggesting you're parroting other people's thinking and then go for the ad hominem, the personal attacks. Right. And all of these uh, ways in which to not consider what you're trying to say. It's like making endless excuses not to taste the dish that you've prepared for them or the medicine that you want to give them because really they know it's good for them, but they're scared to taste it or they fear the possibility of the difficulties in taking it and reflecting it and reflecting on it. It's like when it's kind of like when people say, Oh no, I would never take a psychedelic or I would never go to a silent meditation retreat. I would be too terrified of like what's in my own head. They're like, I know there's something mm. there, but I'm too scared to actually look at it. I find that weird as an attitude. If you know there's something there, it's like, shit, I need to look at it. No? Well, this is what Carl Jung argues. Basically, the place in your mind, the subject, the issue, where you feel most resistance and kind of like, ah, is where you need to look. Because mm. it's actually the thing that is dominating and controlling you. I think people struggle with... The, they are the mental equivalent of what Arnold in his prime would have called girly men, <laughs> which is super <laughs> non-PC. <laughs> but there's no mental fortitude. There's no discipline whatsoever. You can't be afraid of your own thoughts. Like, you have to have tools and frameworks to operate. In fact, like, like you're saying Jung, right? Yeah. Just knowing that there's something that makes you uncomfortable should make you go, aha, interesting, mm. and like delve further. That should be like run towards and or at least take note as opposed to running away scared because something's popped up. It is inside your head. It's virtual. Like you can control it. Here's a, here's a kind of silly example that's not as intense as maybe some of this psychological baggage. But I, I noticed this the, the other day where... And I'm like, how much of this story do I want to tell? Okay, here we go. Um, <laughs> the other day where um, I, someone was talking about, like, in the context of having sex, taking poppers. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, yeah, no way. No way. Absolute bullshit. It's just losers take those things. And the response was like, well, okay. And the conversation moves on. And then I'm like, 
why I, I asked myself, why did I have such a strong reaction to that? Like, why do I care enough yeah. to have such a strong reaction to that? And so I thought about it and went, huh, you know, I think it's just because when I first heard about these things, it was related to a particular group of people who basically just got drunk all the time, were not interesting, fun people, and they were kind of checking out from life by just taking these things right. plus an element that they were probably having a lot more fun and sex than I was <laughs> so I associated like the bad feeling of jealousy with that as well as the sense of like I don't want to be like you and okay, this kind so of I don't want to be out. like you but really I do yeah it's <laughs> basically a mixture of those things but that was a moment where I was you know kind of well done me I think just going instead of just riding the tide of that you know an intense like flicker of judgment it's like where did that come from because hmm. it doesn't fit with my other attitude to you know mind altering or whatever su substances of like okay well let's take them on their own terms and so on hmm. i haven't taken poppers since <laughs> <laughs> well i tried them once in a club actually and it was um it was weird kind of a really shit high a little bit kind of dizzy funny for about 30 seconds or maybe it was a bit longer but not very thrilling hmm. apparently much more useful in the bedroom as a muscle relaxant <laughs> noted noted just so you're ready <laughs> I mean, is that a threat <laughs> it, could be, it, could be, it could be a threat um were you about to add something or shall i take us further um, through the letter I would just, I mean, I'll only touch upon it briefly here, but I, I, I've been thinking more and more about mental discipline and treating, training your mind as you would learning a martial art. And there are several visualizations or mental techniques that anyone that's listening to us with interest because they're trying to be better should be thinking about. And um, I, I mean, I've been thinking more and more that Perhaps my mission is to deliver those to the people that are like what we were saying before, you know, find your pack, the worthwhile mm -hmm. people to help. I think I want to do that because there are plenty of people out there that I think are worth something, but they get stuck in silly little things like this. And it doesn't have to be that way. You should be able to have control over your sense of ego and id and coalesce or diffuse your consciousness around problems and be able to sort of separate yourself from your decisions or from your worries and see them uh, and basically build the virtual program of your mind into something that is more deliberate mm -hmm. and more capable of making things happen under its own volition as opposed to just being buffeted by the waves of everything that's happening anyway yeah, I was just imagining that sounds sounds like sounds like we need to write a book. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I, I I forgot to tell you. You're gonna write my Bible. <laughs> oh okay, yeah. And I should have guessed. I, I need a better name for it, but um, essentially, I wanna I wanna say these things out loud. But I'm not a, I'm not a good writer. I'm I'm an okay writer, but I'm not a good writer. Well, that that's 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 fine. I I can do the writing. I can do angst and writing. Okay. Often together. <laughs> so Seneca. He turns back to Lucilius and tells him, okay, you know, never mind this other dude. You should be thinking about yourself uh, some more instead of, like, going around scattering all of your advice to every fucker who comes into your path. He um, says, stand firm in the face of things which have terrified you. Do not count the number of those who inspire fear in you. Would you not regard as foolish one who was afraid of a multitude in a place where only one at a time could pass? Just so, there are not many who have access to you to slay you, though there are many who threaten you with death. Nature has so ordered it that, as only one has given you life, so only one will take it away. So there's a, a couple of things going on here um, that I picked out anyway. Um, that We kind of often imagine, and fuck knows I do, that we need to fight all of our battles at once. And that creates an enormous sense of overwhelm like all these plates are spinning or all these arrows are coming towards me and then you're like well i can't stop all of them shit where seneca is saying you have to deal with everything one at a time yep and with the one death thing um 
I mean, maybe you, I don't know if you took this a different way, or probably you did, because this made a connection in my mind with something else that I was reading. Um, he talks about there's only one death, and yet I think in our lives we, we kind of kill ourselves over and over again, that we beat ourselves up at least over and over again. Now I was reading we this... murder or outright let die different parts of ourselves at different mm. times of our lives. Yeah. You said that with a smile. <laughs> it's... Well, it's kind of like you have to find humor in that darkness, I think. Mm. It's one of the ones where you kind of go, that's kind of funny, but it's also very sad. Mm. So uh, it made a connection for me to this book I recommended to you called The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz, um, which I have a sense is maybe like it's, it's some massive bestseller. So I don't know if it, people have an association of it as being kind of airy fairy stuff and but it's drawing on this very deep wisdom, the Toltec, um, like with kind of Az Aztec, that part of the world, the Toltec wisdom. Um, and it's another way of like many systems of, of thought and self understanding and self discovery. It's a very interesting framework about not being drawn into the vision of the world other people are trying to force on you. And one of the things that he, he points out is that we're the only animal that suffers for a mistake more than once. Like if an animal makes a mistake, there's a consequence and then they move on. Us, we make a mistake and we spend the next 20, 30, 40 years going, oh, I was such an idiot. I can't <laughs> believe I did that. What a useless person I am. And we don't need to do that. No. It's hard not to. It comes from our ability to make abstractions. Mm. Uh, we can get lost in them. Essentially, we are uh, Theseus, is it Theseus? Theseus. Theseus, going into the labyrinth without the cotton, like the the wool thread, when mm. we go into our own minds. Was it him who went into the labyrinth? I get mixed up. I I, I think so. Get, I, I always associate him with the with the with the ship, with the the philosophical notion of Theseus' ship. I mean, that's the pronunciation I know, which is like this philosophical idea of, okay, he has a ship and you replace a plank uh when you need to and over the time over over time like every single like bolt and plank and so on has been replaced is ah. it still theseus's ship <laughs> is right. there something is there a theseus's shipness which goes beyond the sheer materials okay mm. different point that's very interesting also yeah, anyway, we'll get back to that. I, I can't rem I, I might be mistaken. I might have picked the I wrong hero. I think you might be right. I think you might be right. I just haven't thought about that. So it's the Minotaur's Labyrinth. Yeah, right? I, think, I think that was, yeah. I'm sorry I've made you doubt yourself. And I believe his love interest was Ariadne. Yes. That gave him the wool and thread to find his way out. But then he was a cunt to her and he like left her, abandoned her on a little island. It is Theseus and the Minotaur. You okay. are correct. I was very into Greek mythology. It was one of the things I was autistic about. Mm. I used to enjoy like some of the retellings, like uh, of of Odysseus and his journeys, and it, this um, famous in the UK a guy called Tony Robinson, who, mm -hmm. who was Baldrick in Blackadder, and also wrote things. and Apparently, is a massive perv. Um, no one's come out on the Me Too there, probably because you'd be too ashamed that Tony Robinson ever, <laughs> ever came on to you. We might want, to want him on the show someday. I don't think we do. No? No, I've heard from uh, too, uh. too many people from, like, you know, he did this archaeology show, Time Team, mm -hmm. for a long time. And I happen to know a bunch of archaeologists, and they're all like, he's a total, total cunt. At mm. least to them. <laughs> um, you know, it's always disappointing to hear. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe maybe I shouldn't judge him on the basis of a few anecdotes like that, but that is how we humans tend to judge people. Mm. Any which way, what, what, how long have we been talking? I can't see. Uh, 50 that. minutes. 50 minutes, okay, we, so. should, we should hustle and my back is killing me. Okay, let's wrap up. Well, not quite. We've oh. got an Epicurean Easter egg. Oh, yeah. Um, Epicurus says, I have never wished to cater to the crowd for what I know they do not approve. And what they approve... I do not know. <laughs> um, so the crowd has to be convinced, says Seneca. It takes trickery to win popular approval, and you must needs make yourself like unto them. They will withhold their approval if they do not recognize you as one of themselves. However, what, they think, uh, what you think of yourself is much more to the point than what others think of you. 
the favor of ignoble men can be won only by ignoble means. So he's saying, I think it's important to see yourself for, in terms of winning favor, it's crucial that people can see themselves in you to make a connection. And then we see that, you know, when we share stories to establish common ground, if you're bonding in the pub or whatever, or every fucking marketer who's like, you know, we've all been there, X, Y, Z, and now I'm a billionaire. Um, we value this idea of like being real, which if you see like a mega celebrity like The Rock, I think people like him because he takes the time to do that so that he can still seem like us somehow whilst also being Superman. Yeah, but it's also in most cases fake. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the best examples of being really real authentic was uh, Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. You know, he was a pe man of the people. He was anything but. He mm -hmm. just appeared that way. That was his marketing persona. Mm -hmm. um, but it was very, very effective. And so it's not really about being true to yourself. It's about being true to a version of yourself which is appealing to the populace. <laughs> that is what Seneca says <laughs> is effective. But I suppose we could try and put a more positive spin on it that if there's a, a part of yourself which is more likable, maybe lean in towards that rather than like right. you've got an anger issue so you don't just fucking shout and be angry all yeah, the time. Yeah, because I mean, if you think, I like outrageous metaphors, if you think of yourself as a flavor of ice cream potentially and mm -hmm. you're like, well, you know, I should try to be a little bit more like vanilla or chocolate and someone comes along and says, no, dog turd ice cream is just as good as anything. <laughs> <laughs> you, you be you. <laughs> it's like, no. <laughs> there are, I mean, maybe it'll make you happier to continue being the dog turd ice cream flavor. Uh, being true to yourself. Dog turd ice cream? Dog, dog turd. Dog turd. Okay. Now, now it's funnier. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say. <laughs> Not doctor. Dog turd. He had extra coffee. Yes. Um, yes. So, uh, yeah, yeah, please. No, and just pointing out that being yourself doesn't mean you'll be effective because some people persona isn't effective. Well, and they don't want to eat dog turd ice cream, even though you've sold it so so well there. Mm. Um, the, I really like the bit about the, f the favor of ignoble men can be won only by ignoble means, which it reminds me of uh, this session. I, I think it came up a few times in the counselor that I saw for quite a while who I get it's actually from the Bible, I guess. He said there's a problem like casting your pearls before swine, which is to mean giving away your best and laying it out there for people who do not fucking value it and then being sad and downcast when they don't give a shit. Like, here's all the pearls, the great things I've created, and I'm just showing it to swine, people that there's no point showing it to. And we all get that, I think, in, in various jobs. And I definitely felt that with my my humor book of just like, I've done all of this, this work, here it is, and the reception of uh, certain publishers being like, no, we don't care. Mm. It's it's hard, although I think in in the case with the publishers, I didn't really doubt the quality of the book, which is what Seneca is suggesting. It's hard still not to to feel kind of a smack in the face from that, and I I don't think this is about like deserving it, like deserving the the the, the positive uh, feedback and the praise, but it's about not putting yourself in the position where the, their feedback can hurt you. Where it's like, I've, I've just composed this beautiful opera. I'm going to ask someone who hates opera, or I'm going to ask this five-year-old child if they like it, and I'm going to be really upset if they don't. But putting, putting yourself in a position where someone's feedback can hurt you, I think, can be in two senses, either by getting rejected or by getting big-headed from praise. Right. Well, the best way to cut that down to a minimum is reject and forget every single bit of unspecific feedback mm -hmm. that was amazing or you're terrible worthless but someone that tells you you know what that particular podcast episode really really sucked because you were just so tired um in your tone that it sounded despondent and it didn't make me want to listen to you which made me antagonize your point of view mm -hmm. that's highly specific and you then you listen and maybe discounting and go, you know what? No, I don't believe it. You still can't. But <laughs> um, objectively analyze feedback that's specific. 
mm-hmm. both positive and negative. All other feedback, pretend like you just didn't hear it. One of the hardest things to do with feedback when it's like of that specific nature is to, at least for me and for people I know, to look at it and go, you know what? You're wrong. I disagree. Because if it's specific, if it seems like it's a valid point of view, and yet ultimately you're like, you know what? No, I think that's just what you're interested in related to what I was saying. It's not what I was saying and what matters to me. But when it's specific, you have that option to kind of go, huh. Yeah. Or, mm. Whereas when it's vague, like either good or bad, it's worthless. It's meaningless. Like what, mm. what about it? Well, what's good? What's bad? Like, you know, you, you, you enjoyed yourself and you didn't enjoy yourself. Well, whoopty fucking do. Whoopty fucking do. End of episode. Um, the, the closing point is what can philosophy, good philosophy, i.e. the good life, bring to you? And Seneca says, assuredly, it will make you prefer to please yourself rather than the populace. It will make you weigh and not merely count men's judgments, which I think is pretty, pretty cool. Weigh, what's the value, what's the weight of them, rather than just like, oh, how many people are into this? How many are not into this? It will make you live without fear of gods or men. It will make you either overcome evils or end them, which is the bit I mentioned at the beginning that I think is about your own code and your own sense of best and of doing your best which is another another thing from that Don Miguel Ruiz book that I was I was dwelling on today it's one of the four agreements always do your best but a key part of understanding that is understand that your best changes in each context and each day if you're tired your best isn't as good as it is when you're more awake if you're having a difficult time, your best isn't so good. If you're forced for to do things in a, lim- in a limited amount of time, it's not going to be as good. But it's still the best you could do at that time. Always strive for it, but don't think that you can always reach the same levels. Be gentle with yourself and recognize what the best is you can do here and now. <laughs> a good way to learn that is if you're ever getting shape in your life and then fall out of it, mm-hmm. and going back to the gym lifting the weights that you thought were you know peanuts puny. <laughs> puny little things and just go oh my god it teaches you like aha uh-huh. like strength where the mental or physical or you know capabilities are not static yeah don't work train operate as if you are at the point you were at your best it's funny because i think I, maybe a lot of people would like to go through life being fucking brilliant all the time, (laughs) which is unsustainable, unsustainable. But if I think of other people I know, like friends, I, it's not like if they're having a bad day, I don't value them. No. It's not like they constantly need to be on fire and turned up to 11 because being a good human is more... It's a longer piece, isn't it? Yeah. It's not about just one loud noise all the way through. There's complexity in music. It's about will and consistency. Like overall, like if some, you know, sometimes someone can fuck you over and that's okay. Like, have they fucked you over a billion times in a row and you're <laughs> still going, no, it's fine. That's <laughs> different. Um, but even so, like the the. If there's something about a person that you just vibe with, then it's less about them being at their peak all the time. It's just them being them Mm. at different volumes in different situations, which doesn't get valued so much. Back quick loop back to the point that I was I was saying about and you were saying that connection where you see some sort of kindred spirit or you see potential in them. That's what's really long lasting and meaningful and important. It's not like, can you constantly smash the targets you've been given? It's more, hey, is there an underlying connection here? Are you somebody who we've got a deeper, consistent something going on with? Whereas, you know, someone who's just all, oh, I smash the targets and I do this and there's no person behind the eyes. It's really, fuck that. (laughs) We need a word for that recognition maybe there's a german word like finger spitzing a fool like a long, big, long one. um it's kind of like harmonics yeah you're like, ding, you're like ding, 
but you play them together, there's like an overarching harmonic between them, and you're like, Ding-ing. oh, mm. yes. There's uh, maybe you read this in the the chapter of my book I I, I gave you about counterpoints. Was that first chapter? I think it was in the in the first chapter. Mm. Um, I needn't go into the, the reason I was talking about it, but we often think of like a counterpoint as like being the opposite of something. I remember that. Whereas, yeah. in fact, if we look at the musical definition, I think we learn an interesting other angle, which is like a a different melody which offers a notable and often pleasing contrast to the main thing. So the counterpoint, in a way, is this fresh thing that comes in, adds something, and in the confluence of the two items, the two pieces create something new and potentially beautiful. Sounds pretty good. I think we should probably end there. It ain't, <laughs> it ain't getting any better, folks. <laughs> All right. Uh, if you enjoyed the show, if you're learning how to human like us, uh, it would help a lot if you can give us a five-star rating and review over on iTunes. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Brian, for yours, which I looked at the other day. I was looking up some some of the latest ones. Cool. And uh, yeah, and because he told me about it, I was All like, right. oh, okay, yes. Nice. Shout out to Brian. Uh, also one of our top Patreon backers. Ah, oh, so excellent. Extra thank you to Brian. Mm-hmm. And yeah, till next time, everybody. Oh, please be silly, be kind, and be weird.